Our webinar today is sponsored by Fairfield County Bank. Now some brief information on SCORE. SCORE is a nonprofit national partner of the SBA. Locally here in Scorefield, Fairfield County, we have 100 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise. We offer three primary value add services to small business owners. Free one-on-one -on -one counseling, which can be requested via request mentor link on our website or the link on the screen. Educational workshops and webinars, over 100, and extensive resources on our website including a network of subject matter experts at your disposal. Our next live webinar is Wednesday, July 6th at noon, and the topic is LinkedIn for Small Business, with Petra Fisher presenting. Look for the specifics on fairfieldcounty.score.org. We also have a large number of recorded webinars on our website that cover a wide range of business topics. These can be viewed at any time by clicking On Demand Webinars. We have set aside for Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button at any time during the presentation. It is located in the lower part of your screen. Our webinar will end shortly at 1 p.m. The session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available at fairfieldcounty.score.org within the next couple of days. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Cliff Inico. Cliff is a nationally recognized authority on small business, legal and tax issues, and is best known as the former host of Money Hunt, the PBS television series for entrepreneurs. He is the author of 16 books, including the Crowdfunding Handbook, Raise Money for Your Small Business or Startup with Equity Funding Portals, and Judges Business Plan and Elevated Pitch Competitions Nationwide. An attorney and small business consultant based in Fairfield, Connecticut, he has launched thousands of businesses in his 40-year career. Now, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Cliff. Cliff, it's all yours. Thank you, Peter, very much, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. And, and first of all, thank you to all of you on this call who are taking time out on a, on a very busy day uh, to listen to a lawyer yammer on for an hour. Uh, about how to raise money for your business. You did hear that I was a lawyer. And if you ever doubted that I was a lawyer, take a look at this slide. Uh, we always tell you what we're not going to do before we, uh, we do anything. Uh, the most important one here is the second one. Um, we are going to get into some legal and tax stuff in this program, but there's a very big difference between giving out legal information and giving out legal advice. Legal information is, well, here's what the law is generally all about, and that's what I'm going to be doing today. Uh, advice is, now here, Peter, is what you should do, and Bob, here's why you should do something different, and Mary, here's why you should do something different. I don't know any of you well enough to really give you one-on-one -on -one advice, so don't take anything. If, if you hear anything in this program that sounds like a good idea and it doesn't work out and your business fails and you go bankrupt and your spouse divorces you, your kids don't want to talk to you anymore, the dog pees on your leg and you're living in a diaper box under the Brooklyn Bridge, you can't sue anybody, okay? That's basically what this is all about. Money makes the world go around. It's a quote from the Broadway musical Cabaret and, of course, the famous uh, movie uh, from the 1970s. Um, undercapitalization is one of the leading causes of small business failure. There are basically three reasons why small businesses fail. Uh, one is the market just wasn't there that the founders you know, thought would be there. No one wants to buy the stuff that the company makes. Uh, number two, uh, people are buying, but the competition is just so fierce uh, that the business cannot, cannot handle it, cannot cope with it. And the third reason is running out of money. Uh, you know, planning is the key to financial success here. Um, you know, and I always tell people there are a lot of people looking to start businesses on shoestrings, and that's okay. But sooner or later, you know, small businesses are like hungry babies. They, they need capital uh, to survive. And you have to start thinking now about where that money is going to come from and how you're going to raise it. There's a, a famous old Wall Street saying, if you eat like a bird, you cannot excrete like an elephant. Obviously, the word excrete is not the word that was used, but this is a family program and we try to make it uh, family friendly here. You know, if your goal is to build a billion dollar company, you're not going to do that with just what's in your checking account right now. You're going to need to figure out ways to, to generate significant capital to launch that business. Okay, so there are two phases 
when it comes to small business capital raising, there's two phases to it. And I think it's important to distinguish between the two. And I, I call this internal capital and external capital. Uh, internal capital is what the founders put in to the company. The founders are you and your friends, family members, whoever is getting involved in the business with you, your partners. You are the founders of the company. And in the beginning, at least, the only money that the company is going to get is the money that comes from the founders. Okay, uh, And then phase two is external capital. When a company is further along a little bit and has some money and has a certain success rate uh, that has launched its business and the business is somewhat successful, then you may be able to generate capital from external sources, uh, friends and family, uh, angels, venture capital, and, and, and if you're extremely lucky, an IPO where you offer your shares to the public. We're going to be talking about that later in the program. But the initial focus is going to be on the internal capital, because that's where I'm bet betting most of you are at this point. So, so when you first get started with a business, there's two places and only two where money comes from for a startup business. And this is, some people may think this is a little bit cynical on my part, but it's just my observation from working with, with 40,000, you know, however many businesses I've worked with over the last 42 years of my life. Uh, yes, that's, I, I know, thank you, by the way, I do look a lot better than, than you might think after 42 years of doing, of doing this for a living. Um, you know, trust me, I, I do look every day of it, uh, trust me. Um, there are only two places where money comes from, from a startup, revenue for operations, what people pay for the goods and services you sell. So when I went off on my own in August of 1996, and the first client called me and gave me a $100 retainer, that $100 was re retainer was revenue to me. I was making money, you know, pretty much from the get-go. Now, that's not true for all businesses, um, you know, but for service businesses, consulting, you know, you, you tend to make money pretty quickly. Once you get your first client, you have revenue. The second place where money comes from is capital from the founders. And that is, and this includes money that you borrow in your personal capacity. So for example, credit cards. If you have 10 credit cards with $50,000 of availability on each, you have 500,000, uh, a source of 500, up to $500,000 in startup capital. Now that's very expensive money uh, if you're using credit cards, but it's money nevertheless. Uh, and I will tell you, I have had clients hit up their credit cards to the absolute max uh, to get the money that they needed to get their, their businesses off the ground. Um, second, mortgages and SBA loans. Here's a dirty little secret. Uh, I know SCORE is, is an organization, uh, one of its missions is to help you get SBA loans and borrow money from the SBA. But here's a very dirty little secret from someone who does a lot of SBA loans for his clients. Um, SBA loans are not business loans. They are personal loans to you. Now, the loan on paper may be made to your corporation or LLC, but the, your business probably doesn't have enough collateral to support any more than a very, very small loan. Uh, what the bank is looking for, or the lender is looking for as collateral are your personal assets, your house, your securities portfolio, maybe your 401k from your prior employer. An SBA loan is ultimately secured by your personal assets. And bankers are not the most creative of people. They're not. My dad was a banker, by the way. I, so I, I grew up with this. What, they, what bankers worship is the loan for, to collateral ratio. You know, Cliff wants to borrow a million dollars and he wants to put up $2 million in collateral for that loan. That is a loan we can make. Cliff wants to borrow a million dollars and he only can put up a half a million dollars in collateral uh, for that loan. That is a loan we cannot make. It's really as simple as that. So when you're doing an SBA loan, SBA loans are really second or third mortgage loans. It's your real estate and the equity in your home that you're really tapping into uh, to buy a, a uh, to, to, to finance your business. Um, you know, what you do is you borrow money from the, and I'm also including like, you know, high locks, you know, uh, home equity lines of credit and stuff like that. That's another example of, of personal capital. The loans are ultimately made to you and you contribute that money. The proceeds 
proceeds of the loan to the business as the working capital that gets it started. Any money that comes from you and your partners and your personal sources, we consider capital. These are the only two places that money comes from for a startup business, a business that is, is, is getting off the ground. And when you're first getting off the ground, your first goal, and one of your first goals financially, is what we call breaking even. Um, and it's really very simple. I mean, if you read books on entrepreneurship, there's a complex formula uh, that you can that they give you about for breaking even, but it really is very simple. You know, at some point, you're going to reach a point in your business where the revenue that's coming in from your clients and your customers each month is equal to or greater than the debts and expenses that you have to pay that month. And when that happens on a recurring basis, your revenue is greater than your expenses on a month to month basis. We say that you have broken even. That's what that means. You're not able yet to make a, a make a, a distribution to your partners. You can't take a return on your investment, but at least you're not putting money in every month to keep the business on life support. Uh, it's really very simple. If you're not generating enough revenue each month to cover your expenses each month, then the founders have to put in capital to, to plug that hole and make sure that the debts and expenses are being paid each month, your rent, your payroll, whatever your, your monthly operating expenses are. Until you break even, until you get to the point where the revenue coming in each month is enough to cover the expenses, your founders are going to have to put out money out of their own pocket. And there's only going to be so long that they're going to be willing to do that. I mean, how many of you would want to hit up your credit cards for two, three years running, waiting for your business to break even? most of you would probably say no. At some point, you're going to say, you know what, this is ridiculous. I got to cut my losses. I got to pay these credit cards off. I'm not going to do this anymore. Uh, and, and, and most founders will reach a point there as well. I always tell my clients when they're first starting out that your, your timetable for breaking even should be six to 12 months for a retail or service business, for a manufacturing business, um, or a technology company, uh, especially if you're, you have a new product that's under development, it may take longer. It may take 12 to 24 months, but no longer than that. If you're three or four years in operation and you still haven't broken even, something is wrong with your business plan and you have to address it. The longer it takes for revenue to cover expenses, the harder it will be for owners to keep the company. Your owner is at some point, your, found, your, your partners are going to balk at putting money in and hitting up their credit cards to keep the money on the business on life support. Um, you know, if you and your partners don't have enough capital to break even within 12 to 18 months, well, that tells me that you probably need a deep pockets partner who has the money and the financial resources to help you get to that break even point. That's, that's one of the ways of knowing whether or not you need a financial partner uh, in the business. You know, you, you may have to bring on a partner. And of course, since that partner is the deep pockets that you are relying on to finance the business, you're going to, that person is going to have a lot to say about how the business is run. Uh, the good news is the sooner it takes you to break even, the easier it is to find lenders and investors. What's the famous old Chinese saying? Uh, success has a thousand fathers, uh, failure is an orphan. Uh, that's a, supposedly a Chinese saying, I don't know if it is or not. Um, you know, If you break even within the first six months and you're coming up cash flow positive, uh, it will be a lot easier to find lenders and investors. Uh, but you wanna to try to put that off as long as possible. If you're like most company founders that I deal with, you want to bootstrap the business for as long as possible, waiting for revenue to fund operations. I have worked with clients and businesses that have been in business for years that have never had to seek capital from outside investors. And they tend to be much happier companies than those that do have to rely on outside investment. So, okay. When we talk, there are only two ways that you can put money into a company. Um, and let's just talk about this. There's a very big difference between debt and equity. Um, a debt is a loan. Um, if I am lending money to my company, uh, I loan the money to the company and I am repaid with interest over time. There is no such thing as an interest-free loan. A lot of people don't realize this. When they set up their companies, uh, they do some kind of a note where it's 0% interest, and you should know that that's not technically legal. Uh, the IRS requires that every loan of any kind bear interest at at least 
what they call the AFR. It stands for Applicable Federal Rate. Um, if you go to the irs.gov website, please do not go to irs.com. That is not the right website. That is not the government. That is, let's just say that there's some very not nice things going on on irs.com. You go to irs.gov. That is the Internal Revenue Service website. And you type AFR into the search box. Uh, it will come up with a revenue ruling. They do it each month showing you what the AFR is. Right now, as we're doing this program, it's right around 3% per Annum. It's the lowest legal interest rate. If a, if, a, if a loan has interest less than the AFR, then you know on audit, the IRS will impute interest to the loan. Uh, so if you do a 0% loan and you get audited, the IRS will impute interest at 3% and you're going to have to pay taxes on that interest, even though you never actually saw the interest in the form of cash money. So whenever you do a loan, always make sure you know what the AFR is. Any lawyer or accountant can tell you in two minutes what it is uh, and, just, uh, and just do it. The thing about debt is that debt must be repaid. If debt is not repaid on time, then the loan is in default and the lender can do horrible things. They can sue you. They can, you know, if it's a secured loan, they can you know, take your collateral uh, and basically leave you with nothing, you know, leaving you in your underwear in the middle of the street. That's basically what they can do. Um, the, thing, the, the thing about debt is though, it, and so the thing is though, the, the good news, here's the good news and the bad news about debt. The good news is if the company fails, if the company goes belly up, the holders of debt get their money out before anyone else does. They have the best lifeboats on the Titanic, all right? And that doesn't mean they're gonna get all their money back, <laughs> but everybody else, you, your founders, other shareholders have to wait to get paid until the debt holders get paid off. That's what the debt holders are buying. The negative about buying the debt is that there's no upside to it. The only thing, the only legal obligation you have to a, a lender is to pay the loan back with interest. As long as you do that, the lender cannot tell you how to manage or run your business, uh, and they can't get any, their return is limited to the interest on the loan. So if you do an interest, a, a loan at 6 7% interest, the only thing that I am entitled to get as your lender is that 6 or 7% lender. If you grow and become the next Facebook or the next uh, Meta, I'm sorry, Meta, or the next Google, all I get is my lousy 6 7% interest on my loan. That's all I get. But in exchange for that, if the business goes south, I get, I get, I get out with most of my money intact. Okay, that's the trade-off for debt. Now, equity is the other way you put money in to a company. This is not, uh, equity does not get paid back. Uh, someone makes a capital contribution and receives, receives a percentage of the startup. So Mo, Larry, and Curly start up a business. My apologies, I always use the Three Stooges, uh, by the way. Uh, and, and, you know, it used to, it's so funny, until I started practicing law and working with entrepreneurs, I always thought that the Three Stooges were fictional characters. Uh, they're not. The Three Stooges are real. Uh, I, and every day, I feel like a, a, an extra in a Three Stooges short. Uh, I, I'm the, you know, the guy that gets the first cream pie in the face at the end. That, that's, that's how you feel sometimes when you work with entrepreneurs. It, it's, it's a crazy way to make a living. Um, but, but equity means you're putting your money in and you get a percentage of the company. In a corporation, it's called stock. In an LLC, it's called a membership interest or some kind of, it's called units of membership interest, which function like shares of stock. Okay. Um, it, it, holders of equity only get a return if management decides that they should and the company is profitable. Uh, the law in virtually every state is that, is that if a company is not profitable, if it hasn't broken even yet, it cannot legally give its, its equity holders a return on their investment. Um, you know, if, you know, so, so that's the thing you have to remember when you're putting money in, it's, it's, we used to call it in the old days, sunk capital, S-U-N-K, meaning that the money is sunk into the business. And if the business sinks, the money sinks with it is how it works. Um, what's the trade-off in equity? Okay. Um, we said in, in, when it comes to debt, holders of debt are trading off the right to grow, to grow with the company in exchange for getting out quickly if the company fails. Well, in equity, it's just the opposite. If the company fails, the holders only get their money out after everyone else does. Once the, you know, the creditors of the business have been taken care of and all the debt holders and lenders have been paid, then only then, if there's anything left over, do the, do the equity holders get the crumbs that are left on the table. 
The trade-off for that, though, is that the holders of equity have the right to manage the startup business. And if the business takes off, if it becomes the next Facebook or Google, these are the people who become filthy rich because they own a share of all the future profits, whereas the lenders are limited to their interest rate. Okay, that is the trade off with equity and equity can be voting or non voting. Um, you know, some people want to make an investment in the company, but they don't want to be involved in the management. You can do non voting stock or non voting uh, equity interest, membership interest in an LLC. This is the difference between debt and equity. And it's very important to realize there is something in the middle called preferred stock. Uh, this is for corporations. Uh, it's a separate class of equity, and it's basically in the middle. Uh, somebody who holds preferred stock, if the company fails, they get their money uh, after the lenders get paid off. The lenders always get paid off first. But once the lenders are paid off, if, there's if a company has preferred stock, the holders of preferred stock get their money out before the other shareholders, called the common shareholders, get their money. Uh, but it's equity. So if the company takes off, um, the, uh, the, the preferred stockholders get filthy rich along with the common shareholders. Um, investors such as venture capitalists tend to like preferred stock because it enables them to straddle the fence. Uh, if a company doesn't do well, well, they get their liquid, they get their what they call their liquidation preference. They get their money out before the before the hoi polloi, the common shareholders get their money out. Uh, but if the company does succeed, they get rich along with everybody else. So it enables them, um, um, you know, uh, it enables them to sort of straddle the fence, which is why they like it. We're not going to spend a lot of time copying that. That's kind of preferred stock is kind of an advanced topic. Um, there are two ways and only two ways that money uh, goes into a company. You can either make loans to the company and be repaid with interest, that's debt, or you make capital contributions to the company and you get founder shares, that's equity. Okay, loans. Um, the thing you have to remember here, and I'm not going to go into the taxation of all of this, because that's a very advanced topic. In fact, I do a separate program for SCORE uh, called, you know, sweat on sweat equity investment and, you know, how to deal with that. But the thing is, if you're, if you're lending money to a company, the loans do not have to be what we call pro rata. Capital contributions must be cap, must be pro rata. If Mo, Larry, and Curly own a company and they own a third, a third, a third each, and the company needs money, uh, say $100,000, that means Mo has to put in 33,000, Larry has to put in 33,000, Curly has to be th put in 33,000. If any of the three of them do not put in their full share, it affects their percentage ownership of the company. They are what is called diluted is what that means. Dilution is a very simple concept. It means that you own a percentage of a company, but if you find yourself owning less, you, owning less if your shares represent a smaller percentage of the company uh, because of various things, that is called dilution. Um, you know, capital contributions must be made pro rata, but loans do not have to be. Uh, loans. So if Mo, Larry, and Curly, you know, own a third, a third of a, a third of a business, and you know the company needs a hundred thousand, and Mo, you know, happens to be the rich guy with the deep, deep pockets, Mo can lend the whole hundred thousand to the company, and it doesn't change the equity ownership of the company. Mo, Larry, and Curly are still a third, a third, a third. So the solution, what we do when we set up a lot of tech companies, is we form the company with as little capital as possible, like a hundred dollars, and any future contribution that the owners make are made via uh, by debt, by loans, through something that we call a grid promissory note. What is a grid promissory note? It's like a private, private revolving line of credit. Uh, the note, it's an IOU. It basically says, hey, I'm the company. I owe, I owe Cliff Enico, you know, Cliff's going to make loans to the company, loans to me from time to time. And when he makes these loans, these loans are going to be noted on a grid, like a little spreadsheet attached to the note. On such and such a date, I loan $5,000 to the company, CRE, my initials. And each time I make a loan, there's a note on the grid. When the company has sufficient revenue, these loans will be repaid in the order made, and those repayments are going to be recorded on the grid as well. Take a look at your checkbook statement, uh, your checkbook statement, if you have a checking account. This is a perfect example of what the grid looks like. Check number one, check number, check number three, payday, I get paid this much. Check number four, check number five, check number six, 
payday. I get that's exactly what the grid looks like. It's a record of loans versus repayments, and that's all it is. Uh, and it's a great way for founders to put money into the company. I strongly recommend them to all my clients. Uh, it doesn't cost anything at all to put this in place. The only thing is, of course, that when what you don't want is a situation where Mo, Larry, and Curly are putting loans into the, making loans to the company and not telling each other what is going on. Uh, there has to be some some communication between people so that when, you know, at the end of the day, when, when people see uh, what, how many loans need to be repaid, there's no surprises. Someone said, well, wait a minute, Mo, why did you put 50,000? You say you put $50,000 into the company? Man, we didn't see that. You know, where was that money? You know, what, what did you do here? You know, there has to be when you're using grid promissory notes or grid notes, you have to make sure that there's good communication among the, uh, the company founders. Okay, now let's talk about sweat equity uh, people. Let's say that Mo, Larry and Curly start a company. Uh, Mo and Larry have money, they can put the money in, but Curly doesn't have any money. He's the, he's the genius who's going to uh, put together the, the, the app or the software product, uh, the SaaS product, or he's the person who really knows the business and he's gonna work his tail off in the business 100 hours a week to make this business happen. As you always knew that Curly was the smartest of the three students. You always knew that. Um, okay, you know, what do you do in a situation like that? Okay, well, if you're not careful, uh, so, so we call Curly a sweat equity player. He's getting shares in the company, but he's contributing his labor to the company, his, his work to the company. Okay, the, basically the way, the way a capitalist society works is his capital contribution of the company is deemed to be zero. Money is determined to have a value, but labor is determined not to have a value. We all have bodies. The theory is we all have bodies and we all can contribute our labor to the company and, our, and, and labor has no fixed value. We are free to contract with, to, with any employer for our labor. So in theory, at least, and this goes back to David Ricardo, the early 1800s, for those of you who took a, a history of uh, a business or economics course in college, um, you know, the, the idea is his, so Mo, Larry and Curly want to put money into a company. Mo puts a hundred thousand in, Larry puts a hundred thousand in, Curly doesn't put any money in, but his interest, his one third is deemed to have a value of a hundred thousand dollars. And that creates tax problems because if, if you set up a company that way, Curly is going to owe taxes at the end of the year on a hundred thousand dollars yeah, money he never saw in the form of cash. We call that a phantom income problem. Um, you know, sweat equity value players pay tax on the full value of their shares in the year of acquisition. So, and, and there's no real way to solve this problem. Uh, you can minimize the tax liability by issuing non-voting shares over a period of time. Uh, in an LLC, these are called profits interest, but you have to be very careful when structuring a company that has sweat equity members, because if you don't do it right, these people get clobbered with taxes. And it's, it's really very unfair. It's one of the great inequities of our tax code uh, that you know somebody who contributes labor for their shares is taxed differently than the people who put money in. Okay, so that's internal capital you know, setting up. And I hope you don't mind that I spent so much time on that. That's not probably why most of you, um, you know, signed up for this, this course. Um, but uh, it's an important thing to cover because that's where most of you are. Um, you know, so. Okay, now, so somebody asked the question, um, you know, does the does breaking even include your salary from the business? And my response to that is, <laughs> That's my response. Uh, salary, you don't take a salary when you're starting a business, my friend. Uh, that is not how it works here. Uh, you don't take money. If, you, if you're in a company that's not breaking even, you don't take money out until such time as that business has broken even. Uh, don't get me wrong. I shouldn't say that. You can do it. Uh, there are people who take money out uh, of the company. Uh, it, it's called living off the business. 
and that kind of thing. That's why, but, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you have to be profitable. Um, if you are taking money out as salary, you really have broken even at that point. If you have money left over to pay yourself in the form of salary, then you have made a profit. It's just that you are, uh, you are devoting that profit to, you're putting it in your pocket and living off of it. Uh, there are a lot of companies, a lot of small businesses out there that have never technically had a profit in the accounting sense, but they have had a profit. It's just that the owners are living off, they're skimming that profit each month uh, for their household and other personal expenses. Technically, the company hasn't broken even yet uh, in an accounting sense, but it really has. Uh, if a company hasn't broken even in a real sense, there's no money left over uh, to pay to pay salaries or anything, any compensation to the owners. All right, so now let's talk to part two here. Let's talk about external capital. Uh, this is down the road. You've been in business for a while. You're successful. You're making money. You're broken even. You're showing a profit. Profit. Now it's time to, to to check on outside investors. Who are these people? Um, you know, and and where does the money come from? Well, a very common debate. And for most small businesses, the first external capital that you look for is what we call the friends and family offering. Uh, you hit up your friends and your family. Uh, and it's sometimes the only way the startups can get money. Uh, my my advice to all of you is. Whenever you're dealing with friends and family, and especially when you're borrowing money from friends or family, don't treat them as family or friends. Treat them as total strangers. Do the same paperwork with them that you would get with a, a total stranger investor, say me or somebody like that. You know, nobody trusts a lawyer, right? So you, when you're dealing with me, you're going to want to be very careful about what's in that paperwork. You should do the same with um, uh, with when dealing with friends and family, uh, you know. So, for example, uh, Uncle Louie wants to put ten thousand dollars into your company. Is that debt or is that equity? Is he loaning money to the company or is he putting a capital contribution in? If you if you don't make that clear then Uncle Louie has the ability to remember the transaction any way he wishes. So remember the difference between debt and equity? So let's say your business goes under and you see Uncle Louie and you say, hey, Uncle Louie, I'm afraid my business failed. I can't pay, you know, I'm afraid there, there's no money for you. And he goes, well, what do you mean? I loaned that money to you. I expect that paid with 6% interest. You know, I mean, if you're, you're in default, man, I mean, if you don't pay that, I own this company, I own this thing. Um, you know, but that's not, that wasn't your deal. But now Uncle Louie, if Uncle Louie's not a nice guy, he can now make this deal out to be any way that he wants to. Likewise, if the company takes off and you go back and say, hey, Uncle Louie, this, I really appreciate the $10,000 loan. Here's it back. Here it is with interest. I gave you, can give you a couple of percentage points more than I said I would. And he says, wait a minute, loan? That wasn't a loan, dude. That was a that was a, that was an investment, man. I, I I put in that money for ten percent of your company. By the way, where's my stock certificate? My accountant's bugging me about that. Uh, you got to give that to me. I own ten percent of this sucker. You know, again, no paperwork means that Uncle Louie can make the deal out to be anything that he wants to after the fact. Beware of people who give you money. There, there are some people in this world and they're very sweet. They love you for who you are, uh, who will actually give you money, but always, always get it in writing. One of my very first clients that I had when I, when I went off on my own you know, about 30 years ago uh, was a young lady, very tragic situation. Uh, she had started up a boutique, a clothing boutique in uh, Westport, and uh, she did very, very well. Uh, actually with the business. But, um, you know, she had borrowed her startup capital from her Aunt Irma, uh, not her real name. And, you know, Aunt Irma was very sweet and she loved her niece. She she wasn't trying to play any of the games that Uncle Louie was playing. Uh, you know, she really intended the money to be a gift. She expected nothing back from her niece because of it. Uh, you know, there was no question that, that she was, she had good intentions, but uh, Aunt Irma was 89 years old. A couple of years later, Aunt Irma passes away. The estate goes into the hands of an estate attorney. And without proper documentation, an estate attorney cannot treat this as a gift. They have to treat it either as a loan or as an equity uh, investment because the attorney's duty is to maximize the value of the estate. That's what his or her job is. So if a, so if a certain financial transaction is not clear and doesn't have proper documentation, uh, the, um, uh, the attorney or whoever becomes the executor of Ann Irma's estate cannot just shrug his shoulders and say, well, it was clearly a gift. We're gonna, not going to worry about it. That could expose him to malpractice liability to the heirs and beneficiaries 
beneficiaries of the estate who are really his client. Uh, so my advice to you is if someone gives you money, get it in writing. There's something called a deed of gift. It's a one page document. Most attorneys will do it for you for a minimal fee. Make sure there's documentation saying that Aunt Irma intends this as a gift and does not expect to see a return. And watch out for gift taxes, by the way. Under federal law, you can only give 15, up to $15,000 to somebody without the federal gift tax uh, you know, kicking in. So watch out for that. If it truly is a gift, you have to watch out for gift taxes. Um, also keep in mind that family members, even if they, even if, even with proper documentation, family members may feel that their investment entitles them to make demands upon your company. You know, hey Cliff, uh, listen, you, I see you got this company business now, you're doing great. I'm, I'm glad that I, I made the investment that I did. Hey, listen, you, you all know about cousin Harry, right? He's, he's just lost his job at the factory and he's got three kids and, you know, it's really a messy situation. The wife is talking divorce and all. Can you possibly make room for cousin Harry in your organization somewhere, you know, somewhere where you can't do too much damage because we all know cousin Harry's not too bright. Um, you know, people will do stuff like that. They will impose upon you. And, be, and if they're one of your biggest investors, what are you, you going to do? Well, legally, they have no right to tell you what to do. But as a practical matter, you know, if you want to survive next Thanksgiving with these people, uh, you have to uh, let at least listen to what their opinions are. Um, keep in mind also that if you do a friends and family offering, and there's more than five to ten family members uh, that you that you that you give a piece of your business to, uh, you may have to register it in some states. Uh, Connecticut, for example, says that if you do an offering to ten people, doesn't matter where they are; they can be anywhere. Um, you have to file a uh, what's called a disclosure statement with the Connecticut Department of Banking in Hartford. Uh, so keep that in mind that if you're doing a large, if you have a large group of friends and family that you're pitching to, there may be compliance requirements in some states. Not the SEC doesn't care. You can raise up to five million dollars and nobody cares at the SEC. But the, some of the states, especially the smaller states like Connecticut, have uh, filing requirements and things you have to do. All right. Make sure you get the same documentation you get from an arm's length investor. Uh, and these are the documents that they, yeah, you have. Uh, There's a subscription agreement with something called an accredited investor questionnaire. This is basically a questionnaire that says that these people do not need the protection of the securities laws. You don't have to count them in determining the number of investors. Um, I could give a whole course on that. Um, make sure they sign the shareholders agreement, or if you have an LLC, the operating agreement, and then make sure they get some evidence of what their, their investment is. Do a stock certificate. You can download stock certificate forms free on the web and just fill them in. Make sure it's the right state. If you're doing an offering under Connecticut law, do not do download a Delaware form of share certificate. Make sure you're using a Connecticut stock certificate. But those are the documents you need to make sure that they get. Um, consider the convertible promissory note. This is a note that can be converted into equity uh, at some point. Um, and it's a nice little tool. Again, it enables the investor to straddle the fence. You know, if your company fails, then they can treat it as a loan and get their money out before anybody else does. If the business takes off, they can convert into equity and grow with the uh, with the company. Uh, and consider, again, the grid promissory note, especially for family members that are putting their money in in the form of loans. OK, that's the friends and family offering. Let's talk about angels and venture capitalists. Tech, there really is no distinction between the two, but angels are usually considered wealthy individuals who can provide you with up to maybe a quarter of a million to a half a million in capital. These are people who cannot put $5 million into your company, usually. Um, you know, there are angel groups. Um, so I, I've given you the names of some angel groups here. Um, uh, the Connecticut Angel Guild, which I'm actually very involved in, uh, they do the they uh, usually provide judges for the annual Connecticut Business Plan Competition, uh, which is I'm, I'm, and I am also very frequently a judge. There's something called Topstone Angels and Reading Landmark Angels. Look these group up groups up online. Uh, basically, you go and you pitch to these people, and if they like what they hear, it's just like Shark Tank. Uh, you know, they'll make an investment in your company. Don't expect a lot. This is not a place to go for a million dollars in capital, but you might get a quarter to a half 
a million, you know, from these people. Keep in mind that sometimes these people have hidden agendas. So let's say, for example, you approach a prominent sports figure. Let's say you know an NBA basketball player and you want him to invest a quarter of a million in your company. Well, he might do that because he wants to be seen as, you know, he, again, these people are celebrities and celebrities only have one concern, which is how they look in their public relations. What's their image? OK, they want to be seen as, you know, doing good things for the world. And if you have a company, especially a company that has a bit of a social orientation, you might find some celebrities. But keep in mind, their motivation is to look good at all times. And you have to honor that and you have to respect that. Um, you know, so that means you got to be very careful when you're dealing with these people. You know, you, you can't do anything with your company that might tarnish their image or make people think badly about them because they invested in your company. Uh, you know, getting investment from celebrities is a, is a two-edged sword. On the one hand, they can help you promote the business. They could be your ambassador, your brand ambassador. They can be a, an endorser of your products. Uh, or services. But on the other hand, they tend to be very demanding because they, you know, they're investing in you, not because they like your business, or they're looking for the return on their investment. If they're an NBA basketball player, the return on a quarter of a million dollar investment is nothing to them. Uh, what they are concerned about is their image and how this is going to make them look better uh, and build their personal brand. So just treat that with respect. Venture capitalists are professional investors who invest a million dollars and up. Uh, oh, we didn't talk about Connecticut Innovations. Connecticut Innovations is a, is a, is a unique organization in Connecticut. It does uh, make startup financing uh, to various companies. Um, the, the, the one thing about you have to recognize about Connecticut Innovations is they are primarily a job creation agency. What they are looking to, their motivation in investing in a company, they're not necessarily looking for the best technology. They're looking for companies that will create jobs and get people off the welfare rolls in the state of Connecticut. So if you and a buddy are doing a software company where it's always just going to be the two of you, you're not probably going to be that attractive to Connecticut Innovations. Uh, you know, if you're looking to do a company that's going to hire, you know, 15 low income people within the next year, that's the kind of company that CII uh, is going to be more attractive to. Uh, I'm sorry, that's a, that's kind of a gross oversimplification. You should definitely look at Connecticut Innovations. Uh, we call it CII uh, as a potential investment source, but just keep in mind that they have an agenda too. Uh, and you have to fit that agenda if you're going to meet their criteria for investment. Uh, venture capitalists are professional investors. The good news is they're not limited. They can invest 1 million and up, even you know, 5, 10 million sometimes. Um, but these are not long-term investors. The thing you have to know about VCs is that they want to get their money back in three, five, seven years. These are not people who are going to grow a legacy business that's going to be around for 100 years. They want to get their money back with an, usually an internal rate of return somewhere between 15 and 20 percent per year. That's what they want to get. They don't want to be lenders who are limited to a three or four percent or six percent return on investment. They want to see a much bigger return on that investment. They want to see what they call an internal rate of return of 15 to 20 percent year over year uh, for their investment. And they want to get out in three, five, seven years. They most often get preferred stock, uh, which are issued in rounds. Series A, B, and C. I mean, the Series A, B, and C don't really mean anything legally. It just means that there is sort of, sort of a, a custom that when you do a, a, a Series A offering, the proceeds are used for particular things. When you do a Series B offering, the proceeds are used for different things. Uh, I gave you an article here that kind of goes into what exactly does a Series A, B, and C mean, but it really doesn't mean anything. If you borrow money from some people, and then a year later, you go back and look for money, you can certainly call it Series A, Series B. You know, it really doesn't mean anything. Uh, just remember, whenever you deal with venture capitalists, the golden rule, he or she who has the gold makes the rules. These are people who are going to want to run your company uh, and be very careful how much equity you give them. Okay, the initial public offering, this is the holy grail of entrepreneurs. For every thousand companies that are started, I'm sorry, for every 100,000 companies that are started in this country, maybe 10 will end up doing an IPO and going public. Okay, it is, it is the top of Mount Olympus here that you are dealing with. 
Uh, basically, you're, you're, you're selling your shares to the public and you're registering with the stock exchange to be a public company. You must register the shares with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and state securities regulators. You have to prepare a prospectus, which is a very specific, detailed business plan, and give it to all prospective investors. There's a lot of hoops that you have to jump through. And even when you become a public company, you are now regulated by the government. You are regulated by the SEC. The SEC has a lot of rules for public companies. You have to file annual and quarterly reports. Whenever you have a material change in your company, you have to notify the, you have to pile notices with the SEC. Uh, there are a gazillion accounting rules that you have to comply with. Being a public company is, is, is a wonderful how can I say it? It's a wonderful experience to go through. But once you are there, you realize that public companies are scrutinized much more carefully than private companies. This is why you're seeing a lot of companies now, uh, you know, public companies that are trying to go back to being private companies again, because they have more freedom of operation. They can't, they, you know, the, the big complaint that I always hear from my friends who work for big public companies is we can't do the things we want to because we have to account to our shareholders each quarter. Every quarter, we got to tell them what we're doing. You know, we can't always say, well, you know what, we're not going to pay a dividend this quarter, this month, or this quarter, because you know, we want to we want to keep money in reserve to launch this big new project that's going to totally transform our company. Wall Street may not allow you to do that. They may punish your stock price if you do stuff like that. Once you go public, you 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 no longer are an entrepreneur anymore. When you go public, you are you are an administrator. You are not an entrepreneur. You are running a successful company. You are not growing a company anymore. There's pros and cons to going public. Um, you know, there are alternatives, though, to, to IPOs. There's private placements. Uh, those are, you know, basically private offerings of shares to uh, accredited investors. Um, you know, accredited investors are people who are so sophisticated that they don't need the protection of the securities laws. So a Series A preferred stock offering to venture capitalists would be considered an offering to uh, accredited investors. And then the newest player in the game, which is what I wrote my recent book about, is equity crowdfunding. So let's talk about crowdfunding. Um, the uh, SEC passed regulation crowdfunding in uh, 2016. Uh, it's been around now for six years. And basically what, what, what the crowdfunding rules say is that you can raise up to $5 million a year from total strangers without having to go through all the mishigas of doing an initial public offering with the SEC. Okay, that is basically what it does. But, uh, but as always, when the government lets you do something, they always impose conditions on it. You can't just go on your website and say, hey, we're crowdfunding, we're looking to raise $5 million, send us your money. You cannot do that. That is still not legal. Uh, there's a very specific procedure that you have to go through. You have to prepare a disclosure document, like a business, like a detailed business plan, describing your business. It's actually very similar um, to the loan application that you would file with a bank for an SBA loan. And by the way, SCORE can help you with that. Um, you know, if you're looking to get an SBA loan, SCORE can help you with the application process. It's not a very far leap from that document to a disclosure document for a crowdfunded offering. But you can't just do it yourself. You have to register on a portal that has been approved by the SEC. The SEC has approved about uh, 50 uh, crowdfunding portals at this point. Uh, seedinvest.com is one that I have worked with. They're based in Manhattan. Uh, basically, what you do is you prepare your disclosure document. You register. You put everything up on a portal. Uh, it's, it's basically a website. Uh, the portal creates a page for your investment. And then what you do is you send notices to everybody in your social media saying, hey, we're looking to crowdfund. We're looking to raise $2 million. Here is a link to our crowdfunding page where you can see what we're doing. All communication with investors has to go through the portal. That is the most important thing. You cannot just contact people on your own. The only thing you're legally allowed to do is to contact people and, and push them to your, your crowdfunding portal. Should you do crowdfunding? Well, it all depends. Crowdfunding is ideal for consumer-facing companies, B2C companies that have compelling products, services, or stories and, a, and or a large following on social media. Right now, 
if, if any of you out there wanted to invest in a, in a crowdfunding, how would you do it? How would you go about doing it? Most of you probably wouldn't even know where to begin. Okay, well, okay, you, uh, so what you, what, I, so what Cliff's saying here is uh, crowdfunding companies that are looking to crowdfund list their offerings on a portal. Well, where, it, where are these portals? Who are they? Where are their websites? Um, you know, there's right now in 2022, there's nobody out there trolling crowdfunding portals looking for the latest new hot investment, the, the next Facebook. Nobody is doing that. What is happening, however, is that people are getting emails from companies that they are interested in saying, hey, uh, you bought our product a number of years ago. Uh, you're on our, you liked us on Facebook. Uh, we are, we're crowdfunding. Here's a link to our crowdfunding portal. Uh, you know, if you want to invest in us, here's an opportunity to do so. Um, the companies that are benefiting from crowdfunding so far are companies that have very large followings on social media that they can tap into. Basically, what crowdfunding does is it takes the friends and family offer offering and it turbocharges it. It brings it to the next level. Instead of hitting up Uncle Louie and Aunt Irma, you can now hit up your 10,000 social media followers and ask them to invest in you legally. That is the, the company. So, so the kind of companies that are benefiting from crowdfunding are companies that have a large following on social media. Here's an example of a perfect we have a perfect crowdfunding. Um, I'm, I'm actually working on this. I can't give you too many details on this right now, uh, but I am working with a rock band, a, a rather famous one, uh, a band that you may have heard of. Let's put it that way. And that's all I can say. This band uh, is looking to crowdfund to do what they call a jukebox musical uh, on Broadway based on their music and their catalog of music. Those of you who know the musical Jersey Boys, um, that is an example of a jukebox musical. It's the story of the four, Frankie Valli and the Four Seasons and it's all their music from the 60s. Uh, right? Well, this group wants to do something similar. They have a writer who's written a, written a, a script and they're basically looking to set up a separate company and raise money for the, uh, you know, for the, for the Broadway show uh, that's gonna feature their music. Uh, and they've got they've got over you know a they've got millions of followers on social media that they can hit up for this, and they're going to do what's called a tiered offering. Uh, for a hundred dollar investment, you get the original cast album for the show. Uh, for a thousand dollar investment, you get you know free tickets to the balcony. Uh, or something like that. And for, you know, investments of $10,000 or more, you get an opening to the launch party where you might see some of the band members and the celebs, some celebrities and all that kind of stuff. So that is a perfect example of what crowdfunding is doing right now. It's not for everybody, but if you have a business that has a strong following. So for example, if you have a craft brewery, for example, uh, that has a strong local following and a lot of following on social media, you know, people are buying your beer because you're, you're, you're a local business business and they, people have loyalty to that. That's the kind of company that's benefiting from crowdfunding yet. Uh, right now, you're not seeing a lot of tech companies doing crowdfunding because their advisors, people like me are saying, well, don't, don't do a crowdfunding yet, because if you do when you're successful, you've got all these people now uh, that are investors and you have to take care of these people. Keep in mind that if you do a crowdfunding and it's successful, these people now are your partners. You've got now a thousand partners and these are not sophisticated people. These are not people who are gonna leave you alone. They're gonna call you every day saying, how are you doing, how are you doing? Where's my money, where's my money? How are you doing, are you making money yet? I put $10 into this thing. I have heard anything from you in a month. How are you doing? What you what you doing? What what's going on? Give us some news. They're going to bug the crap out of you. So be very careful with crowdfunding. If you do a crowdfunding, make sure you dedicate a member of your management team to be the investor relations person who's going to communicate with your crowd on a regular basis and try to keep them from turning into a mob. So that's basically it. This is my my best-selling book. This book has gotten incredible reviews so far. It's the general consensus that I have written the Bible for people who are looking to do this kind of crowdfunding here in the United States. Um, and it's only 20 bucks, you know, available where all books are sold. Um, we're at about five minutes before the hour now. So let's take a couple of questions. Um, I saw a couple of things here in the chat room. So I'm going to try to do as many of these uh, possible. Um, you know, when I borrow money 
when I loan, I guess you meant to say, when I loan money to a business for a startup, how do I record this in the financial projection statements? How do I get the money out with interest when the business starts generating revenue? Well, the second question is easier. How do I get the money out with interest when the business starts generating revenue beyond the break even? Well, the answer is you pay yourself back. You know, and if you have partners, you should pay your loans back pro rata based on their percentage ownership. As far as how you record the loan, the loan appears as debt on your balance sheet. That is how you record the loan. Loans to shareholders are treated exactly the same as loans to a bank or other outside lender. Um, they are, uh, they're treated as debt on the balance sheet. Um, okay, um, let me just go down further. What would you recommend are some good financial methods to avoid the walking dead syndrome for small businesses? Well, there really aren't any good financial methods to, if you have a walking dead business, a, a walking dead business means that this is a company that's just basically on life support. It's not doing anything. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a zombie. It's still alive, but it's just barely on life support. You, that's not really a financial problem. That's more of a business problem. You're not making money. Uh, there are only two ways that you can grow a business. You either uh, generate more revenue or you lower your costs, you cut costs. So if, if your business is a zombie business, your costs are probably minimal. Your job really is to get some revenue into this company and frankly, generate some more excitement for it. Uh, you know, so, um, you know so, it, so that at some point you will break, uh, break even. Um, how do you call a, a, a relative, um, a person relative, who loans money, whoops, who loans money, but with no interest for a person startup. Okay, I don't understand what you were trying to say there. I'll be very, very honest. I think what you're trying to say, um, um, you know, how do you, how do you, gener how do you, do you, you sell somebody, you talk somebody into lending money to your company? Well, basically get them excited about the business. You know, let them see that this is something that's going to happen. They're going to get their money back with interest, offer them a higher interest rate than what they could get from a bank or a certificate of deposit. I mean, that's how you talk these people into uh, making a loan into your company. Consider also a convertible loan where if the company takes off, they can convert the loan into equity and grow with the company down the road. I mean, that would be the best way. That, Other than that, I don't understand the question. So I'm going to pass on to the next one. So someone can give you up to 15000 if it's a gift, then you won't get taxed on that money. Um, the short answer is you may be taxed on that money, even if it is a gift. Um, you know, uh, Section 61 of the Internal Revenue Code says that gross revenue is money from all sources derived, um, but you don't have to pay it back to the person who makes it to you. A gift is a gift. They don't expect anything back, so you don't have to pay the money back, but you still may have to pay taxes on it. And if it's more than, and if it's more than $15,000, you have to file a gift tax return uh, with the IRS, uh, IRS each year. So just be careful about that. I mean, it's a good problem to have. Um, okay, now let me just take a look at this next one here. If I am going off on my own as a consultant with my living expenses as my only expense, how should I finance myself for six months until my first invoices are paid? And how do I pay myself? Well, the answer, the, the okay, so you're starting up a consulting business, okay? Um, you know, right now, you know, the good news about consulting businesses, and to some extent, I am in a consulting business too. I'm a lawyer, uh, but I'm really a consultant, really. I mean, I, I, I consult the small businesses and entrepreneurs. One of the good things about being a consultant is you don't really have a lot of expenses. You don't. I mean, you know, you, you're, you know, there's only, maybe you'll buy a few books. Maybe there's some travel expenses if you have to go where your clients are, but you really don't have a lot of expenses. Everything goes to your bottom line and you can live off that. Now that's the good news. Now the bad news about being a consulting business comes at tax time. It's very hard to get deductions in a consulting business because you don't have a lot of expenses. I mean, there's only so many law books I can buy in a year, you know, um, you know, I, I don't usually entertain my clients. My clients entertain me, 
You know, they're the ones who invite me out to dinner and they pay for it and they get the deduction. I don't take clients out for dinner very often. Uh, so I don't have a lot of the deductions that, you know, someone operating a retail store or a factory, a manufacturing plant would have. That's the, 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 the curse of this. The good news is with a consulting business, all you need is one client and you're probably breaking even. The bad news is at tax time, all that income is going to have to be uh, subject to taxation. Uh, that's the, the good news and the bad news. And all I can say is welcome to the club. Make sure you're pricing yourself uh, properly. Is it wise to rent office space versus home office, especially for the business deduction? It's really six of one, half a dozen of the other. The home office deduction is not considered a, uh, an audit trigger anymore. You should not be afraid to take the home office deduction. It's probably the biggest deduction you can possibly take. And I think I hear Peter breathing in the background. So I'm gonna stop asking questions and turn the floor over to him. Peter. Thank you very, very much, uh, Cliff, uh, for the absolutely dynamite session that you provided to uh, the SCORE listeners. As a reminder, a recording of this webinar and materials are available within the next day or so on the Fairfield County SCORE our website under on-demand webinars. Uh, we'd like to thank again our sponsor, uh, First County Bank, for sponsoring this webinar today. Um, and on behalf of SCORE, we'd like to thank each and every one of you for participating. And we strongly encourage you to reach out and get a mentor to help you uh, grow and start your businesses. And the links are available on our website and on this presentation. With that, we bring our session to a close and many, many thanks, Cliff. Have a great day. Thank you, you too. Good luck to all of you out there.